Thank you for tuning in to The Teacher Dudes. Whether you're listening as a podcast or joining us live on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, this is a podcast created by teachers for teachers that's full of some random thoughts, ed tech, tips, and tricks, and a general focus on education today. Sit back, relax, and enjoy as your hosts, Tyler Keefe and Jeff Anderson, take it away. Well, happy Wacky Wednesday, everybody out there. My name is Tyler Keefe, and I am one of the teacher dudes. My partner in crime, Jeff Anderson, is not here yet. As it is Wednesday, he is doing his weekly tutoring with one of his students, which is awesome. So he'll be joining us here in a little bit. But again, my name is Tyler Keefe. I am a technology integration coach down here in Nampa, Idaho. You can find me on Twitter at Keefe67. And then I am one of the hosts of the Teacher Dudes podcast, which we just finally got a Twitter, uh, which is at Teacher Dudes. I know, real creative there. Uh, But we are doing our bi-weekly. We're doing this every other week for the Idaho Education Chat. And before we get to that, there are a, there is a couple of things. First off, I do want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for everything that you do for our students out there, because that's really why we do what we do. Um, but then also, we have some fun things coming up here at the end of February, uh, middle of March, you know, and that stuff coming up. It is starting to be spring conference time for the education world. And one of the conferences that is coming up is Spring Q, which is happening March 18th through the 27th. And it is all virtual um, with with that. Uh, some of the featured speakers here we're going to have are right here up on the screen. Christopher uh, Emden, Jennifer Gonzalez, and AJ Giuliani. I had the pleasure to hear uh, Jennifer Gonzalez speak with Joe Marquez on his Super Share uh, this week, and I'm really excited to hear her speak some more. And then there is going to be a few more other speakers, a lot more other speakers, but these are some of their featured speakers on there. Some of these people I have heard speak live in person, and then some virtually in fall queue, and it was an amazing amazing time. And then also up here in the Northwest, we have NCCE happening from March 17th to 20th. So it's a smaller conference, but it's going to be awesome as well. Uh, We do have some featured speakers on here. One that I wanted to highlight right here is Tyler Rablin, who is from Sunnyside, Washington, uh, right outside where I grew up in Zilla, Washington. And he's going to be one of the featured speakers there. And then they are closing off the conference with Dr. Joe Sanfilippo, who is an amazing speaker. I heard him speak last year, literally about a year ago, uh, down here in Boise. And he was a phenomenal speaker and really just changed how I look at things and changed how I approach things in the classroom. But with that, we are going to bring on our guests tonight, and we have a couple of fellow tubists, tuba players. I don't even know what we would call call somebody that plays a tuba, but Jim and Sarah Windish, how are you guys doing tonight? Delightful. Great. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, now, if I understand correctly, you guys both play the tuba. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I I hear there's a funny, awesome, whatever story you want to say about how you two potentially met surrounding a tuba. Uh yeah, we actually met in marching band. Yeah. The U of I Vandal marching band. Uh, Go Vandals. <laughs> uh, we met on a trip where the band played halftime at a Seahawks game. Oh, nice. Go Hawks. Yep. Yeah, I can't bring myself to say go Vandals, but go Hawks. <laughs> right. It's funny for you. It's fine. <laughs> you, you know, fun, fun story. My senior year of high school, I went up to U of I when uh, Tom Cable was the coach up there. And uh, we had football camp and he was me being a lineman. He actually coached our our group a couple times. And that was that was a lot of fun. Um and my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, they both actually live in Moscow. 
and my brother-in-law teaches at U of I or does used to and is involved with the university there at the the newspaper still. Um, I believe it's called the Argonaut. Yes. Something like that. Yes. So, so yes. So we have some U of I connections, even though I am a BSU uh, alum for my master's, but not, not my undergrad. So it's all, it's all good. From, from the decor, I, I maybe have a guess at the undergrad school. Okay. No, actually see, that's a, a it throws people off. My, my grandpa actually played football up at UW okay. uh, back in, you know, the f- late forties, I believe until he broke his shoulder and couldn't play anymore. But uh, so that's just been the family history. You know, we're UW people. Uh, my undergrad was actually from central Washington university. Nice. And so, yeah, it's, it's fun. Although, you know, I'm down here in Idaho. So, you know, it, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, take a second and tell me a little bit about you guys outside of the tuba world. Go for it, Jim. All right. Um, so I'm I'm an elementary school teacher. Uh, uh, my career has been split between teaching fifth grade and um, teaching in our advanced learning program, which is what the Coeur d'Alene School District uh, does, I guess, is a gifted program, but more inclusive. It gets a few more students in it. Um, And then this year, I am back to teaching fifth grade, but I am teaching at our fully online e-school. And um, in addition to what I do in my classroom, I started the Idaho Kids Vote Book Award. And um, uh, that's really a pet project of mine, getting uh, kids to read some um, recently released excellent uh books for grade readers yeah nice that's, that's me i don't think that's everything for me because i'm a music teacher uh i have taught elementary school music for 16 years and then this year is um entirely different i teach fourth grade online uh for the lakeland online academy in my school district strict they are not having elementary specials and you know because of all the COVID goodness I am uh, entirely mine so I have a class of fourth graders that I am teaching Woo! <laughs> and I mean no that I might want to be long walks on the beach and you know no Yes, actually. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. So you guys are both in the classroom, you know, in different ways. Um, Jim, you know, you, you mentioned you're a fifth grade teacher. Myself, I taught fifth grade for 13 years before becoming a, a technology integration coach. So not only do we have that tuba connection, but we have that fifth grade connection now, too. So I think we just became best friends. Awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad I was here for that. There you go. There you go. Well, all right. Well, it looks like I believe we do have our first question posted from Janet, the lovely Janet Avery down in Jerome. And the first question tonight was, how are engagement and motivation related or connected? So again, how are engagement and motivation related and connected? I'm going to throw that to you guys first. Well, I, uh, being in a classroom, uh, I definitely see that the more my kids are engaged in what we're doing, the more motivated they are to, uh, interact with it and, uh, uh, you know, learn. It and expanded themselves too to, to really dig deeper into it. Um, if you if you are creating things or um, allowing students to explore things that they are interested in, you are you're going to get more more buy in, and maybe that helps when it comes to the tougher stuff, the stuff that there's not as much choice for students to be able to. Do. And I just kind of think about it. I mean, 
have students with a lot of different motivations. Some are, are motivated to, you know, get it, get it done and go do something else. And I think the engagement once you get students engaged and looking to keep pushing it colors their motivation, changes that motivation from one of um, completion or um, being motivated by external factors having that motivation to really just learn and suffer and um, I think students have a lot of views about motivation and engagement from just classmates, but us as teachers too, the more engaged uh, we are with content or with them as people, the more engaged and motivated they are too. Um, and the more engaged we are, the more we love what we're teaching, uh, the more our students are willing to, to engage with that too. And I find that in, in elementary school music, I mean, it's a, it's a fun class and it's a bit of a, a break from, you know, that cognitive load that they might be getting studying fractions or, you know, adaptations or whatever they might be doing, but it's still very, it's still a cognitive load. It's still very rigorous, but it, I, it's highly engaging and they want to do it. So they're motivated to come and do it. No, yeah, I know for me, the engagement and motivation, it's really related, uh, connected fairly, fairly simply, I think, um, because without the engagement, you're not going to get the motivation to really do anything. The students, they want that buy-in. They want to see how it affects them. They want to see how they're going to use this in their future life. Um, you know, they're tired of hearing the, you know, why are we doing this? Because I said so. They don't care. You know, it's, they want that buy-in. They want to be able to... Um, understand and see how it's going to help them. And for a lot of, a lot of students, once you give them that, why, why we're doing something, they'll quickly jump in and roll with it. So I think that that's also really important. And we're going to touch on a few other things um, with this and it's going to come out here in a little bit, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because the students do definitely want that buy-in. They want the, they want the why, and I, I, I would assume you guys, as as teachers, also when you when you're talking with your admin and things, you also want to know that why. You know, why are you asked to do something? Why this? Why that? It and it doesn't me matter if you guys agree or not with them. It's just more that you just want to understand. Is is that a? Do you guys feel that too? Yeah, well, and absolutely um, this year, I've seen that even more where there are so many things that are changing, uh, both for good and bad. And I mean, a lot of a lot of the time, the answer for why is COVID. But yep. um, I, I want that. I, I want to dig further and get that. Why? You know, why is this how we react to our challenges we have this year? And, and with that, why, how can I make that more applicable to me and my situation? Um, even if I don't agree with the why, I can find a way to make it more palatable or more applicable if I know why and where they're coming from. Yeah, I think that that's really important because, you know, you, you, Jimmy said it perfectly is right now we can use COVID as everything is, yeah. you know, why do we have to wear a mask? Well, COVID, duh. Why do we have to stand six feet apart? COVID, duh. But when when you get a kid asking you, well, why do I have to write this two-page paper? And your response is, because we've always done it that way. That's not a good enough why anymore, I don't think. No. no. You know, it's it's tough. I I struggle. I struggle when I hear that these days. Yeah. Because I, th I think there is an opportunity to examine some of those things that it's just, we've always done that. Um, rather than come up with the why of how do we adapt it to fit COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And you, Sarah, you know, you, you said you, you're a music teacher now, how, or, you know, you've been a music teacher. I think I said that wrong, but how, how do you adapt what you're doing even just because of COVID and try to explain it and deal with it, I guess. Well, in the spring, when I still got to do um, musical stuff, when we were, you know, doing the emergency learning and everybody was home, um, my main focus was really on keeping kids joyful at home. There was a, you know, there was so much unknown in the spring and kids and families were really pretty worried or they were, you know, uncomfortable with what was happening. And I knew that singing and being joyful could help remedy that. And that was something that we could all do together. And so the why of why we were doing that was because it was joyful and it was a release. So that, that was my biggest adaptation was it wasn't about the content and the learning. It was about the feeling of doing it. Yeah. And I think, you know, for, for people that are musical or not music brings that feeling. And I know for me, when I'm at the the gym at four 30 in the morning, every day, when certain songs hit, it's like, boom, I'm just going to keep going. And if it's something that's kind of a, a downer, it's not going to, not going to, you know, help with that. So, you know, bring in as much joy as we can through music, through content, through whatever, then, you know, I think it's huge. And I wanted to bring this up. And it's funny because you guys said posted this in the checks. I was just about to bring this up. Um, but we had an interesting follow up here from uh, Rachel who says, can you be motivated without being engaged? Can you be engaged without being motivated? And that's deep. So, so I'm going to ask that to you guys because you guys brought it up too. And I'm curious your thoughts on that as well. And I, I think, I think both of those are true uh, where I talked about the colors of, of motivation of whether it's uh, that completion or the other thing. But thinking about the engaged without being motivated, man, uh, that's almost like the dream for me is ha having kids come in that are not motivated and they're so engaged that they forgot they weren't motivated. They're just <laughs> going on and, and, and doing great learning uh, because of the engagement. And then afterwards, you know, maybe they'll go, oh, I have found some motivation for that, but they weren't aware of it. It's almost yeah. like, oh, that's what motivation is. Yeah. I didn't know right. that's what that was, you know, or that's what was missing. Because I, I almost think that a lot of times we talk about motivation and especially with younger learners, like we have, kids aren't, they don't know intrinsic motivation yet because they haven't found something that they're passionate about yet, or they are just beginning to discover who they are and what they should care about. And so they get that feeling. They come in and they're engaged and they stay engaged and they're like, oh, I want to know more about that. And then they go learn it for themselves, you know, and that's like that motivation. And they, they think, huh, oh, you know, I, I think... I, I mean, I, I don't want to be the external motivator with the carrot and the stick and the candy bars. Like that's never been my jam. <laughs> but, but I do think for younger learners, they don't necessarily, they haven't learned what it feels like to learn from the inside yet. They don't know that motivation. And so that is the dream to like yeah. have them come in and be engaged and like learn what motivation feels like. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, we're, we're going to segue here because I think it goes right with what you're saying. Cause you know, we're, we're we're teaching children how to figure this out, but then we as adults, as learners need to figure this out too. So, so the question here is what keeps you motivated and engaged as an educator? How might educator engagement be related to student engagement? So, so what keeps you two motivated as an educator? Depends on what time of year it is. Yeah. 
<laughs> Hashtag truth bomb. No, I... <laughs> you know, I I feel really fortunate to have you to bounce ideas off of, and I think sometimes it's that having somebody to talk about these issues with in education to talk about it, my ideas that keeps me motivated in this time of year and there's, <laughs> yeah. a, and there's other times when um you know the motivation comes a little slower a, a little tougher to pull that out of myself yeah i i agree uh, it would it would be pretty dreadful uh, you know to not be able to have that that big idea talk with because sometimes i we need to have that big idea talk in education that keeps me motivated when the little minutia, the grades, the parent contacts, the stuff from administrators, the DO being crazy, the, you know, all of the things. Um, like you gotta be able to have that big picture. I at least need to be able to have that big picture conversation to remember what is important to me in the grand scheme of education. Um, and I, I am very serious. It sounds, you know, really flippant. And I am a very flippant human, but uh, it is true. It depends on the time of year. Um, third quarter <laughs> is, is hard, man. It's hard every year and it is especially hard this year. And I am incredibly motivated by spring break right now. I am looking forward to a time to unplug and not be, you know, because honestly, right now, this is not joyful for me. And I think I'm highly motivated by joyful learning and joyful experiences and having things, you know, be fun and, you know, effusive. And I know if you are on the Twitters or can't see me, I'm like making huge hand gestures. <laughs> That's how I roll. But like, I'm not feeling that. And so I had to find something else to motivate myself. And I think it's fair to say that. And I think it's okay to understand that about human behavior too. I feel it. half my kids, maybe more than half my kids, all but like five of my kids are probably working for spring break too. Yeah. And you know, that's okay. You know, at the time that we're in, and I should have asked you guys this, this long ago, but are you guys still in remote hybrid distance learning or are you guys back face to face? What situation are you in right now? Or is it kind of like, yes? Well, personally, we're, we're in distance learning. We both okay. do, um, jobs with a completely online schools. So oh, that's right. Yes. Uh, school district and Coeur d'Alene school district are offering an all year online option. But otherwise, um, the students in our community are um, back face to face at least four days a week, five days in some districts. Yeah, they went back at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I know down here we we've been back face to face four days a week for um, about five to six weeks now. And so, you know, that's just one of those things where it's like, oh, what, where are we doing right now? But, you know, that's, that's my fault for not paying too close of attention, but that is my fifth grade uh, scatterbrain mind going on as I'm looking at all the screens here. Yeah. And we, we actually, uh, we're going around the globe right now. And um, I posted it a second ago, but Karen Compton is saying hi. And <laughs> she... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. That's how we roll here. And <laughs> she is in Dubai right now. So Karen, good morning, which sounds weird as it's 820 here in Idaho. My part of Idaho, not up north, though, because you guys are at 720. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. 12 hours off from Karen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That That's awesome. But we, we now have our question three here. And this one here, so Sarah, you're going to need to give us a little bit of um, context with this one, uh, <laughs> but it's saying, what does student motivation look like in your context and saying that you want to know what it looks like or what it looks like a pie chart, scatter plot, bar graph, but seriously, what motivates students? I really, I mean, I, you know, I'm a giant nerd. 
Uh, and I really just, I am very curious, like r right now in this context, like if you're hybrid, if you are totally face to face, if you are completely remote, what, how, what a student even like for you, for me personally right now, it is an absolute scatter plot. I have, you know, like three or four kids whose engagement and motivation is a giant blob way up here in this quadrant that is like, boop, yes, winning. And then I have, you know, like five or six kids that are down here in this quadrant with a giant bloop of no, thank you. School is dumb. And everyone else is literally scattered all over the map. Like it is in my brain, I see my student engagement as a scatter plot. And I think I would prefer to see, I would maybe be able to, uh, you know, like better engage or motivate my students if I could see it as a bar graph or a pie chart and see, you know, X percentage of students are, uh, you know, here and I could add more students to that. I could manage this thing more so, but when it is just scattershot all over, I, you know, my techniques are scattershot all over. <laughs> like, what is it looking like right now? That's literally what I want to know. Yeah. And I think, you know, with, with that down here, it's a lot of, yes, it's all over the, it's all over the gamut, you know, when we, we have kids, you know, face to face in school, but also there's some that are at home on quarantine, um, which luckily, you know, cases are going way down, down here. Um, so we haven't had many out, but it's all over. And for a lot of our kids, it's like, Hey, we just want you to be here. You know, we want to see your face and that's it. It's not looking, you know, we're not looking for anything much more than that. And Janet, I'm going to put this picture up here because Janet actually responded with this, with, you know, her answer of grades isn't that what motivates students with her nice little giggles. Yeah. And I don't know the last time when, when I was teaching where grades were the thing that motivated my students because once we went to standards based grading, which is awesome, I do love it. It, it quickly became that grades were not their sole motivation. And it, it's interesting. And I'm going to bring Jeff on. Jeff, welcome to the, the show. Nice to see you. Hi. Hey. Hi. And so, so Jeff, you know, I, I gave you these questions long ahead of time, but we're on number three here with, with motivation. And Sarah was, was wondering what it looks like you know, as far as like a pie chart, scatter plot, bar graph, it's just kind of everywhere. But in, in a quick nutshell here, what, what motivates your students, Jeff? Um, I think, I think two things motivate my students. One of the, fir the first thing that has to happen is that extrinsic, extrinsic motivation, that motivation that comes from outward towards them. Um, and that's the initial motivation to, to uh, kind of teach them um, how to then transition into motivating inward using the intrinsic motivation. Um, so, so starting with the outward, um, getting motivation from other people and then um, transitioning that into where they, mo they can start to learn how to motivate themselves um, instead of having to rely on other people to, to motivate them. Jim, any thoughts on that? Um, well, um, I'd answered that in the written Idaho ed chat, and um, I guess I took a, a bit different interpretation of the question, uh, where looking for a visual of what motivation was, and I posted that uh, Charlie Day gif of the red threads connecting all the uh, disparate things, because I really think that's what's motivation. When students start finding those connections and um, just wanting to connect the dots. And I, I like what uh, you were just saying about the, um, you know, we start with the extrinsic motivation because I think it's, it's relationship 
and helping students like build that wonder and interest and, and engagement, our key word today here, that, um, that moves us from that extrinsic motivation to the intrinsic and that to connect the dots, that desire to pull the whole story together is such a big part of that moving from extrinsic to intrinsic. No, that makes sense. And I got the the tweet up there for you to kind of put some context to what you were saying uh, to kind of help out there. Uh, Jeff had to go let his dogs in from outside. So it's not who let the dogs out, but it's who let the dogs <laughs> in. <laughs> But, you know, you know, with that number or question number four here is saying, what are some indicators of student engagement and what might it look like when students are authentically engaged? And for me on this one, if I remember right, I was saying that time flies. You know, it's it's that thing where you look down and you realize, whoops, it's uh, time to time to go to music class because we just got lost in what we're doing. And then afterwards, it's that that look in their eye when you're asking them, hey, what'd you do? And they tell their story about what they did instead of just telling you the facts. You know, they become more animated, become more joyful going back to what you were saying. And they're like, holy crap. I just did this and blah, and verbal vomited it all out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I loved that. The story of it rather than just facts. Yes, to that. Oh, I got goosies <laughs> about that. that <laughs> just exactly it. That is so good. Yeah, I'd have to agree with the the telling the story about the learning and not just and not talking about the learning itself. Um that is definitely something that shows that they were engaged. Um, also, I think uh, when they start to ask questions that go beyond what you're, what you're working on, um, they start to make connections to other areas. Um, that's showing that they're truly engaged because now they're really thinking about it and not just going through the motions. Yes, when they ask the questions that you don't know how to answer, that is when you've reached great engagement. <laughs> Ask the question you don't know how to answer. That that that's never happened where I've had to sit up there and go, hmm, I have no clue what you're talking about. But no, that happened daily in my classroom. So usually it's because I couldn't understand them and they're using some weird acronym that I had no clue what they were saying. But it, it is good for the teacher to get stumped every now and then. Well, and that and that's a fun place to use the the joke between me and my brother, we know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, Jeff, I'm going to ask you a question here because yeah. you weren't here when, uh, when Jim and Sarah were giving us their their quick little rundown. Um, do you play any musical instruments, or did you play any musical instruments? Um, I played the guitar for a couple of years. Um, the the just the acoustic guitar in my uh, late grade school, middle school years, and I attempted to. I wanted to start playing the drums, but they didn't give me a drum. They gave me uh, two drumming, two two drumsticks, and a little like pad with a rubber uh, drumming thing on it. And I'm like, that's not going to make enough noise. <laughs> so that didn't stick. The guitar kind of stuck, but eventually I wanted it to sound like ACDC, and it wasn't sounding like ACDC. So I stopped it. <laughs> it was sounding more more like the uh, Oregon <clears throat> Duck. Uh, yeah, yeah. Band. Uh, it was it was sounding more like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and that just wasn't cutting it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we were Jeff. I don't think you were here yet, but we have we're going around the world right now. We have a friend, Karen Compton, uh, in Dubai, watching right now. Uh, which fun story? We were just talking on Twitter here that her first job was at my school now, uh, the Sherman Gators. And I was saying, you know, once a gator, always a gator. And then her response to this question that we were talking about is saying, um, when students say, quote, I thought this was going to be so hard, but I did it. And yes, is all I have to say to that. <clears throat> um, yeah. And get ready now because I'm going to challenge you even more. Uh oh. 
What's your challenge? What's that? Oh no, I was just saying if a, if oh, a student said oh. that to me, I'd be like, <laughs> I'd be like celebrating with them, and then I'd and then I'd be like, get ready because the next one's coming, and it's not going to be as easy. I, I totally misread that situation, but you know, it, it happens because I'm I was looking back behind Jim there and all of his guitars and i believe oh it's all sarah's guitars oh yeah. man i was just going off where you guys were sitting uh but we got what five five guitars and is that a little is that a ukulele a ukulele a banjo oh a banjo oh a man banjo. i love listening to like steve martin play the banjo yes yes steve. have you ever seen his tour have you ever got to go see his tour no, we've only gotten to see, you know, through the magic of the TV, but okay. I'd love to back when we can see live music again. That would be Yeah, no kidding. Amazing. No kidding. But he's, he's played, he's had a banjo band for several years though, hasn't he? He has. Yeah. Cause he, yeah. he even did banjo back in his stand up routine days. Yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. wait. Are you, are you talking Steve Martin, the comedian, Steve Martin? Yeah. Yes. No way. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to look this up. I have never heard this before. You've never heard Steve Martin doing stand up, or you never knew he played the band? No, I never knew. Oh, I've heard his stand up. He's hilarious. But no, I never knew that he did he played the banjo. Yeah. Oh, can he ever? Oh man, that's awesome. You gotta go look him up. Yes, I will. As soon as we're done, I'm gonna look that up. Because <laughs> that that's exciting. And you know, speaking of excitement, here is question number five. You know, my nice radio voice. Uh, <laughs> George Kuros talks about student empowerment. How might that be different from engagement? Yeah, I, I'm going to jump right in here because have I, at it. I, I've had an argument with administrators about this exact thing that I uh, engagement should not be our our pinnacle that we are searching for. Mm -hmm. I mean, empowerment is so much more than that because engagement is teacher driven in some ways. It's we have somehow, um, uh, I don't, I was gonna, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was gonna say, <laughs> I couldn't come up with the word because it's not boondoggle or cod swallow, but uh. <laughs> We, we have some, somehow finagled our students into caring about what we care about and doing what we want them to. That's what engagement is. Empowerment is when they are, it's what they want to do. And that this is, um, and it's still going in a, this productive uh, direction with learning, but it is that it's student driven. They, they are coming up with the ideas that push their learning. Well, and looking here on what you responded to on, on the Twitter sphere, you know, linking up nicely with your fourth answer, students who are empowered are given space to take things in new directions and expand upon the learning that is expected of all. And my one more, not my one thought, my initial thought to this is that whole inquiry based learning where a kid has a question and instead of saying, ah, you know, deal with that at home, it's okay, go and roll with it. What you, you want to learn this? Let's go. You know, if, if, if they have the skill at hand and they can do it, then why are we limiting that? You know, why, why stop that kind of learning? Yeah, that um, that that goes right to. I think I'd use this quote in a different podcast we were in um, from a from the book. I can't remember what it, what it's called, but uh, great teachers teach and get out of the way. They say give the information that's needed for students to be able to start to do what they need to do, and they get out of their way, and they're empowered to know that that they can if they need to go grab um, get on the internet. They can get on the internet. If they need to go, go get this resource or that resource, they can do it. They're empowered to know you are in control of your learning. Um, it frustrates me when, when there are classrooms who they have to simply ask for a piece of paper or ask for a pencil. 
No, they should be empowered to be able to take over their learning. Now you kind of have to keep check on that because some kids will take advantage of it, but that's just, that's just the environment that we're in. Um, and I think empowerment, um, it's so close, but I think empowerment kind of leads to engagement. They're empowered to know they can start to do something and you're kind of right there with them to help them along the way. If they get, uh, if they get lost or get frustrated, um, but they start, they're feel empowered to, to start to work on something and then they start to get engaged in it and then well, they get, with- get stuck and they get empowered again. And then they start to get even more engaged in it. Yeah. You know, with that, Sarah, I want you to kind of walk us through your, your response to this tweet here. Well, uh, you know, when Jim, when Jim said that he doesn't think that, you know, engagement necessarily should be the pinnacle of where we should be aiming and that when, you know, higher ups in district administration and principals say, you know, we really want students to be engaged with content. Um, that's to me too much like compliance that a student is engaged with what I have created for them. And I don't necessarily think that a student can be empowered without being engaged. They need to be engaged with something, but it might be engagement in how much they would change what you are teaching or how much they would like to be learning something else that's tangentially related to what you are working on. And at least in my classroom, I would love for them to tell me that. And I would really hope that I have created the environment in my classroom that they would, they would tell me that they would say, you know, that's all well and good Windish, but I would really love to, you know, do this thing. And I would say, great. What help do you need from me? How can I help you make that a reality? Um, Because I, I, (laughs) the idea of like asking for a pencil, like, I don't even want my kids to ask to go to the bathroom. Like I get how it's a safety thing, but like, even that makes me roll my eyes because like, just the compliance, I I can't, I can't handle compliance. Like I, that gets me down. So I would rather have kids feel that empowerment and be in charge of themselves that I um. I think that, you know, if if we're supposed to be the people that are creating and empowering future learners that, uh, you know, can I sharpen my pencil? No, not right now. It's the pencil sharpener is closed. (laughs) That's right. I think you are, you're spot on. I, my biggest pet peeve is when I watch a classroom right now and a kid does this and I look (laughs) at him and go, I go, what does that mean? means I need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Just walk up and say, can I go? Yeah. It's like, all right, go. And then, or they do, you know, something else means get a drink. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like literally just walk up and go get a drink. You don't have to ask, just be appropriate about it. Don't go making faces along the way. Don't mess around. Just go get a drink. Yeah. And you know, right now, and you guys are experiencing this with the, the, distance learning that you guys are doing <laughs> do and i'm you probably have heard horror stories and this is one of the things that i'm like are you kidding me where teachers are telling their students as they're at their house please let me know when you're going to go get a drink please ask permission to go to the bathroom and i'm just like are you kidding me right now you're now a guest in their house you're lucky that they are tuning into your lesson. I have to give that the biggest standing ovation because I, that makes me hot. I, I get, Jim can that's how riled up. Yes. I get but up. at the same time, Tyler, I think that there, there's a certain amount of like, like, I don't, I don't like it when, when, um, when kids use those signals either. Yeah, uh, you know, I and I get all sorts of signals being in PE because everybody's got something different. So I just I just let them know, hey, in PE, Mr. Anderson has a really hard symbol. It's harder than any other symbol that you've shown. Okay, and the symbol is this, Mr. Anderson. Can I go use the bathroom? That's it. Just ask. Just ask. And if I'm in a situation where I'm like, hey, you're going to either hear two responses from me, yes, you can, or can you wait? Because I might be right in the middle of some sort of instruction. Can you wait? 
And then they're going to tell me, yes, I can, or no, I can't. So we're going to build this trust and this dialogue between ourselves. Um, and I'm going to trust the student to know that if they say they have to use the bathroom, they really have to use the bathroom. And so when it comes to, when it comes to something like you were saying online, um, I still want them to be respectful and say, hey, I need to use the bathroom. And then they're going to get the same response. Sure, go ahead. Or I'm right. Can you wait for like two minutes? And then when I'm done talking, then you can go. And then we get to have that, that, that dialogue back and forth of sure or no, I really got to go. Okay, well, if you got to go, you got to go, you know, but if you can wait, it'd be great if you could wait. Well, and in a way, doesn't that also empower the students? Yeah. It gives them a voice. It's not so like, like you guys have been saying, it's not compliance. No, and it builds trust too. Right. It builds trust between you and the student. You can trust that the student means what they say and they're just not trying to get out of work because we've been around plenty of students who feel like that if they go use the bathroom for four minutes, it's going to save them from four minutes of working. Um, but the student gets to trust us too in knowing that we're going to allow them to do things like use the bathroom should they really need to go. Um, it may not be immediate. It may be two or three minutes because we're in some involved in something. Um, but it builds that trust between student and teachers too. Yeah. And with that, before we move on to, or Sarah, did you have a thought there? I was just going to say it's teaching to that. I, I'm a music teacher too. So I, I get you specialist power with, you know, everybody else's like signals and everything it's yeah. Yeah. Too, that it's, you know, you are a human being, you have needs. I respect your needs. You respect mine. Although yeah. I do have to say, I do have to say my first year of teaching first grade, I found out very quickly that when a first grader asks if they need to use the bathroom, you don't ask if they can wait. <laughs> do not ask if they can wait. They just go. Yes, you may go. <laughs> yes. And and with that, what's, what's awesome here is uh, Karen Compton, again, you know, she sent us a, a tweet here. And she's saying loving this with, you know, all of us and she's in Dubai. And if I can't zoom in on it, but you can see that she's watching the live stream. So hello again, Karen, and tweeting as well um, on her MacBook, Jeff. See, there's more people that use MacBook. And again, welcome to the Apple family. Um, you know, I'm going to throw that in every time I get with you. I'm but get the uh, Apple family and the duck hate. OK, we're yes. Good. Hey, that's right. how we roll. And, yeah. you know, we're sitting with a couple of vandals. A couple of vandals. Yes. All right. I'm good with that. I'm <laughs> good with that. Nice. And we're, we're joining via a Linux computer. So oh, there you go. Just make fun of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, nobody can. I, I love Linux. I just don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a tech coach. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but with that uh, question six here, we have three questions to go. And those of you that are watching online um, and listening to this later, appreciate it. Love having you on. Um, and let, let us know if you want to join us for, you know, future chats. Um, but question six here is saying, how do we get students who are already excited and motivated to take the next steps in owning their learning? Uh, what are your best ideas so how do we get how are we going to push those students further is i think the the gist of this question here so i'm going to throw this to you jim and how how are you going to go about this gosh um so one thing that came to mind is um is my i know kids vote book award project um well, I, I got to plug it here. So if you're interested, it's idkidsvote.org. Um, but yes. <laughs> and uh, but thinking of how you have to set up ways for them to take it further, because with that, the idea is, OK, if you read two of the books off this list, you can um, you can vote and we're going to send a medal to the winning author. But in addition to that. There's a Flipgrid where you can talk about the books with the other kids reading it in the state. There is a Padlet where you can just write short little micro reviews. And um, so students who have just been encouraged to read two books, then read all eight books, they create their own book clubs. 
um, they because there is that space for them to take it further. And I've let them know I trust them to take this as far as they want to. Um, and I, I have seen amazing things happen with it. Well, right here, you said so much of this is building that disposition with students, encouraging students to explore further and continually try new things. Um, Sarah, what, what are your, your thoughts on, on this one? Um, to be quite honest, this is my question because I want to know, I, I need your tips and tricks right now. Cause, uh, the, like I said, it's third quarter and I'm kind of doggy paddling and I, I need the stuff. So I want, I want to just like read the, the thingy <laughs> on read stream and like hear what people have to say and then go put it in my plan book. <laughs> hey, no, you're good. And actually that goes hand in hand with the, uh, the next question here for, for me at least, um, which was how do you leverage relationships to build engagement and motivation? And my response, and I kind of uh, stood on my soapbox for this and it hasn't actually appeared on uh, Twitter yet. It's going to show up any, any second here. Um, so I want to make sure that, that I say it right. But basically why are we leveraging these? We, we can't leverage our relationship to build the engagement. We, we have to have that relationship first that first and foremost, we have to have that relationship. We can't, without that relationship, we have nothing. And, you know, the, I, I've said it many times and I'll keep saying it, that the, the three most important things in education are relationships, relationships, and relationships. And with those, then comes the motivation, then comes the engagement. Because once you have that, that relationship, the kids will, they're going to practically do anything for you. And there's no leverage to have. I'm not going to hold this carrot of, Oh, I'll be your friend. If you do this, no, you, it doesn't work like that. And this question I left and I didn't alter it, you know, in our document because I wanted to, to say that, that we have to get the kids. We have to know them because right now, especially right now, more than any time right now, our kids are going through hell. They are. They're not the ones being affected by COVID as much. They're not the ones that are at high of risk. They're not X, Y, and Z, but yet they're the ones that are being hurt the most, not physically, but emotionally, mentally, however you want to say it. And, for me, I don't know. It just kind of it rubbed me the wrong way of leveraging, but that's okay. You know, wasn't my question, and you know, we're here to learn. We're here to to learn from each other. And I'm gonna step off my my soapbox here and gather my thoughts while I let uh, uh, anybody, either any of you three, go ahead and take it from there. I'll start. I'm raising my hand. Okay, Jeff. Yes, okay. comply. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just want to change a word in there. Um, I get, I get the word leverage. I understand what it's meaning by leverage. I don't know if I like the, the word itself, but I get what it's meaning. Um, and I'd want to take the word build out and put increase in, um, because when you're in a classroom with students, um, it is a relationship between you and them. And it's, it's you having intellectual discussions with them and it's, and it's you guys, joking around and keeping it fun and keeping it active and keeping it engaging. So, so you are, um, when you are with them, you are using your relationship with them. I like to use humor a lot to increase their engagement and motivation. Um, I, I just, I try and make it fun. I try and try and crack jokes at them and it just seems to build that energy. And then they crack jokes back at me and I laugh and they laugh and it builds that energy even more. And now they want to just get more involved and more involved. Um, and I, I'm talking more of a PE environment now than a, than a classroom environment because I've experienced where you get them motivated and then they hit a wall cause they're stuck. And that motivation just for some of them can just fizzle so quickly. 
because now they're stuck and they don't know what to do where they were super excited before. Now they're, now they don't know, they don't know what to do. Um, so for me, it, it would be increasing that, that leveraging relationships increases engagement. Um, yeah, you know, I think you're right on there. And I'm just kind of scrolling through the the actual Twitter feed here, and I completely forgot um, to go through some of these. And and Marita, um, who we had on a couple weeks ago, Jeff, you know, she's saying, you know, that the – that reflection and metacognition helps personalize the learning, helps learners discover why this is worth their time. I think that is huge. Um, Jim, on this number seven here, you're saying engagement and good motivation rest on relationships. Uh, it's the whole quote, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care idea. Um, you think that's Teddy Roosevelt, which I do believe it was because I th that sounds right. Have you been able to fact check that in the these days of fact checking? Well, I I looked it up online and I a, <laughs> n a number a number of quote <laughs> sites said it's a Teddy Roosevelt quote, but I'm not sure what he would have said it about. It doesn't sound like him to me. <laughs> mm, gotcha, gotcha. Well, you did put a um a Teddy Roosevelt quote here, I believe. Yeah. Yes. When you play, play hard. When you work, don't play at all. Why, why does that re resonate with you? Well, um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that that also has a lot to do with uh, um, engagement and exactly what we were talking about with joking around with kids and stuff is if, if they know you're going to play hard, they're, they're going to work hard too. And um, gosh, a big thing, and I learned it from you, Sarah, that I have had to teach my online learners where they don't have, um, their day is structured by the clock, is the idea of a work sprint. Oh. That, you know, okay, you're going to work hard as you can for uh, 20 minutes to then take five or 10 minutes to do what you want to do. And so that's um, uh, kind of goes along with that too. And um, uh, I'll, I'll just plug another uh, shameless, <laughs> shameless self-promotion thing here. Go so, for it. You so have the, stuff to promote. That's what you do on a podcast, right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> that, that picture comes from my extremely odd hobby of every President's Day, I recreate a historical photo of a president. So, um, yeah, that that's me as Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, what about Oh, is that? Teddy, that's Saturday cool. On President's yeah. Day, yeah. <laughs> Well, let let, let like me get that. back to that because uh, yeah. I did not realize that was you. <laughs> Maybe if you make the Teddy Roosevelt face. There. Okay. There you go. Okay. For the viewers at home, I feel like they... <laughs> <laughs> That's Well, cool. and lo look in here, you know, one of the responses that that we got uh where was oh right here from janet uh except we have lots of wonder and curiosity when we play so i think that's that's also good i think there's oh man you you almost have to have that good balance between the two well and so much so much good learning is playful learning i mean when you think of they talk a lot about that for our youngest students, preschoolers and kindergartners, but even think of it as an adult. Our best learning is when we are playful, when we are trying, trying things for the joy of trying them. Well, but that's why you play an instrument or you play soccer. It's because mm -hmm. those things are fun and joy. Yep. And they're hard. It is hard to get good at an instrument and it is hard to do wind sprints or drills forever and ever to master a specific skill in a sport to be good enough to be competitive at it or to even beat Joe Blow down the block when you play a pickup game. Like doing drills isn't fun, but getting better at something is fun and it is play. Drills can be play. Mm -hmm. I mean like and that 
that was a challenge for me um, in when I taught in the classroom was I wanted students to enjoy themselves. I wanted them to have fun. Um, but sometimes you have to um, put your heels in the ground and work and being able to switch that switch back and forth. That can be a challenge sometimes because they still want to be laughing and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, but at that time, no, we got it. We're now we're, we're heads down working. We're really pushing ourselves and this, this joking fun energy, energetic side, um, kind of has to take a back seat right now because we've got a, we've got some serious work that we're doing. Um, so keeping that balance between the two and making sure they understand when it's time to be serious and when it's time to, um, more enjoy what you're doing. Because let's face it, some work just isn't enjoyable. It's just straight out hard. Yeah, you know, and and with that, before we go to question eight here really quickly, uh, the the old quote from Herm Edwards, who when he was coaching the New York Jets, you know, he's saying, you play to win the game. You play. It's all about play mm. to win the game. And you have you have a lot of hard work. You practice. You practice. You do all this to win the game. And I had in my classroom, I use the analogy like, "Hey, why are we doing practice?" I n- I never called it homework. I say practice because we need to get better so that we can win the game, which I equated to a test. And why do we do the test? Well, it's all about the game of life. You know, some of the stuff it is to get better academically, but also to get better personally. But, you know, with that with that topic of playing, um, our last question tonight was there are many things in students lives that may be more interesting to them than learning opportunities. How do we avoid having learning or how do we avoid having learning be in competition with these other things. And with that, I always think of the thought from the great movie up of Doug and he's going along talking, talking to squirrel, (laughs) you know, they're so distracted by things. And for me on this really quick, before I turn it over to you two is we need to incorporate it. We need to remember that, You know, when cell phones were first a thing in the classroom, you know, we're not going to be able to compete with them. We know kids are going to be able to be playing with them. So instead of canceling it, how about we incorporate it into what we're doing? How can we use what they want to do in the classroom? How can we now, you know, as kids want to play among us like nothing else, how can we use that in the classroom to our advantage? Um, in a way, and just kind of have some fun. So, so Jim, Sarah, what are your quick, quick thoughts on this one here? Um, well, you, you're bringing up Among Us is uh, it's really interesting. I play Among Us with my kids every Friday after our oh, cool. And we, it's not tied to learning. It is just something that we all enjoy and we all do together. And I think that there is always a push in education to make the thing that kids enjoy educational. And I think that's really disingenuous. The kids can tell, like, put your fidget spinner on here and use it for a, a spinner in a math game. Woo! You know, like, pfft, that <laughs> tell, and that it's not fun. So, like, just if you enjoy it too, enjoy it with them. Like, I showed them. I show my kids builds we do in Minecraft. If I didn't use a Linux box, we'd probably do Minecraft EDU stuff because I have kids that are way into that. Like if I can genuinely enjoy a thing too and talk to them about it without looking like a total noob, great. Or if they want to like teach me about it, cool beans. I think that any chance you get to teach someone something, you know, The kids love to teach me about things in my music classroom. They love to tell me about like this new band or this cool thing, or have you heard this song? Or I love that. Sometimes I haven't heard about it or I can say, Hey, this is a lot like this old thing that was cool, you know, a thousand million years ago when I was hip and then they listen to it and they think it's cool or they think it's old, you know, like that engagement, it's building that relationship. And I think that, you know, as we're talking about, engagement and talking about 
relationships as I sat here and listened to you guys. I think that's a really important piece of engagement that we didn't necessarily touch on and maybe deserves a little bit more time to stew about with everybody out there and thinking is engaging with one another in relationships, not just engaging with content, but engaging with each other, conversating, conversating. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um, But having a conversation about things and engaging in things, uh, you know, being together. So. Well, and learning how to be together. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do that all over again. And I think that's okay. I think it'll, you know, that fresh start might be really good for a lot of us who are not necessarily great at peopling. (laughs) No, I hear you. I hear you. Jeff, do you have a quick thought on that before we wrap up? Yeah. Throw that, throw that back up there. Would you, so I can see it again. The, the question. Yeah. The question. There you go. Yeah. Um, So I I don't think we avoided it all. Like, like Sarah, 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 right. Don't get that wrong. Okay. Sorry. Um, I don't think we avoided it all. Um, um, I think that we, that we teach students how to have uh, self-discipline to be able to know when it's time to work and know when it's time to do something like a video game or something else. Um, like Jim, right? Yes. I want to make sure I get this right. Jim, like Jim said, uh, the 20 minutes of hard work and then the five, 10 minutes of, of doing whatever you want. So, so if we're teaching students how to be, how to be more than just students, um, that we want to teach them how to have self-discipline and how to be able to say, okay, it's time for me to do this. I'm going to get my head down and do this. Okay. It's time for me to go to recess or whatever the case may be if they're at home and hop on a video game. Okay. So now I'm going to do that. And we start to, we start to allow them to understand how to do it. Um, and we, um, let them make mistakes with it. We let them be successful with it. And we let them learn how to be better as they become older. Um, And hopefully they will start to learn some things from it. And when they become adults, they will be better, better for it. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Jim, do you have a follow up there really quick? And if we have one moment, I I want to shout out to a teacher I'm working with this year. Our our e-school is kind of interesting. We have all the teachers at the same grade level in the same room. And so I'm working with a fabulous first year teacher named Brie Barber. And uh, she um, playfully got that, that, you know, kids are on a computer. They have multiple tabs open. And so her class came up with the the rule that there is no double georging. So double, (laughs) yeah, double georging is, you know, having your two tabs open and you're playing a game in one during class time on the other. And just the fact that they drew that line, but the students gave it a playful name, I think has made it very successful in her class. And man, I've got to get my kids to come up with a name for that. So uh, they'll uh, (laughs) draw that line too. Double Georging. Yeah. Where, where did George come from? I, I have no idea, but you know, George is that guy who has 80 tabs open at once. I I'm thought his thinking. name was Jim. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 or yeah, yeah, yeah. That's don't don't double George. <laughs> don't, yeah, I like that. I like that. I might have to use that tomorrow with one of my teachers just so they can look at me like, what are you talking about, Keith? 100%. I want to hear more. I want to hear (laughs) this. I I will will sneak it in because I am sure there's nobody at my school watching this right now. And if you are, don't don't rat me out. but with that here, this has been fantastic. I've I've really enjoyed this conversation with you two. Um, where where can we find you two on Twitter or um, I know Jim, you mentioned you're at the idkidsvote.org. Did I put that in there correctly? Yeah, I I think my current host, you have to have the www before okay. dot idahokidsvote.org. Yeah. And then where can we find you guys on Twitter? I am at SL Windish. And uh, yep, you got it right there. And that's my handle on Instagram too. Those are the only socials you can find me on. So look me up. 
that's I, I only have main, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, and, and mine is teacher with tuba, so everybody thinks I'm the music teacher in the family. But, it's true. But, they have no idea what I do except, but, like, be snarky and post gifts. Yeah, but, but actually, I'm I'm just a music enthusiast. Hey, but there's there's nothing nothing wrong with that, and Not I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you two one last question before we exit here. What is your one go to song? that just kind of gets you ready for that day with students. And Jeff, you think about this one as well. For, for a day with students. All right. Okay. Uh, I spent a lot of a really hard year listening to Raise Hell by Dorothy to get myself psyched up to go to school. And it it's a real good, like yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it right. And even if people don't like it, I know I've got this. So uh, I'm, that's, that's going to be my uh, walk up song. I think <laughs> it's very fitting. <laughs> Jim's like, yeah. <laughs> well, and mine's a pretty new one. It came out just about the same time that schools closed last spring. And it's uh, Keep Your Head Up by the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. And uh, yeah, that's um, actually just this week, <laughs> I, I put together a playlist and we're both trying to contribute to it called Positively Hyped. That is that positive music that you play before you start your school day. So um, that was my first contribution to it was Keep Your Head Up. And Jeff, what are your thoughts? Well, you had you had to throw in the get ready for school because I was going down the Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, ACDC playlist. Hey, but that's and, okay. Uh, well, yeah, you know, it is. It is. But honestly, here's the one that I have played, and I have played enough times driving to school where people next to me are probably like, Whoa, what's wrong with that guy? Um, it's uh, Mercy Me, Happy Dance. Seriously. Oh, yes. I just get moving, and it just gets me ready. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get that happy dance. I, yes, I love me some mercy me. And people aren't looking at you weird because of the music. They're looking at you weird because of that duck sticker you have in the I windshield. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that's probably it. <clears throat> and my song right now, I'm actually, I want to make sure that I have it called right or named right. Sorry. is It's help is on the way. It just was released by Toby Mac um love the song that's like currently right now but all time is best day of our lives um i can't think about who plays it right now i've played it so many times but i love it so what's that american authors yes yes i love that song i would play it every morning when the students would walk in and they got so annoyed of it that I stopped playing it. No, I did not stop playing. It. I kept it going because I wanted today to be their best day of their lives. And with that, I appreciate you two for jumping on with us. Um, Jeff, as always, it has been a fantastic time. And Jim and Sarah, again, thank you. Let us know when we want to have you two on again. We can just talk purely music for uh, for an episode. We yeah, I, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. I can get involved. I play a mean radio, so you know. It, 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 uh... All of my kids to play the radio, so that's perfect. Hey, that that's a skill that kids need to have, so we're all good. <laughs> but uh, all right, we will talk to you all later. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much. It was a great time. If you'd like to join us live and interact in future shows or to be a guest on the show, be sure to follow Tyler Keefe on Twitter at Keefe67 and like the Teacher Dudes on Facebook. If you haven't already subscribed to the Teacher Dudes, hit that subscribe button on whichever platform you're listening to and be sure to also leave us a rating.